My dad likes to tell me stories. Horrible stories. I don't think he means to tell me horrible stories. He just likes talking to me. We walk around the backyard together, my dad and I, and he shows me the plants and creatures that live there, and he tells me stories. Horrible stories. He holds my hand and points out pumpkins and beans and toads and spiders as he tells me his stories. He doesn't have a loud voice, my dad. He has a kind voice, though, the sort of voice you'd expect from a dad that told nice stories. Except he doesn't. I don't know if he tells stories because he's going bald or because they're the only stories he knows. He swears a lot, my dad. He says rude words and asks after Jesus. He also mutters all the time under his breath and walks with a limp. Animals like him, though, and children. He's friendly to children and animals, and he spends a lot of time with his plants. He plants flowers and creepers and trees and shrubs and vegetables. He doesn't sing when he works, my dad, although he smiles when he's happy, which is most of the time, except when he injures himself, which is quite often. When he hurts himself badly, normally on his balding head, he swears and says bloody and other rude words. He looks angry, and his limp gets even worse. He glares and scowls, and you don't want to be near him after this. He keeps working, though, because my dad's dad would have wanted him to. Work is what dad does, and what dad's dad did. As well as tell his stories, I don't think dad even realises it, but all of his stories end horribly. They might start out nicely, and he'll say, Ah, that reminds me of a fellow I knew, before telling a story that sounds all fine and dandy, but actually ends in a way that's horrible. Dad doesn't mean to scare me when he tells his stories. I don't think he even knows they're scary. He just thinks it's a story he knows from his life, and that as his son I might be interested in hearing it from him. Because all his stories are true, he doesn't make them up, which I sometimes think about as I lie awake at night. Because if all Dad's stories are true, then what about my story? Will it be horrible? Dad doesn't think so. At least he tells me that when I get scared. He's always kind when I get scared, and he reads me bedtime stories from books that aren't horrible at all, because they aren't his stories. In fact, they end up being quite boring, because Dad's stories are the best, even if they are horrible. Whenever Dad and I go for a drive in our car and there's a traffic jam, Dad tells this story. I don't know whether he forgets he's told me the story before, but as we sit there and wait for the car ahead of us to move, he tells it again. I remember being stuck in traffic once, he would say. When I was a younger man with a nice head of hair, I was driving up north to Toowoomba to see your mother. Yes, Dad, I would reply, looking up at him. And from there he would tell me how he would drive through the mountains, where the road wound from one curve to another like a snake, and how he would have to go slowly to make sure he didn't run over someone riding a bicycle who was hiding round a bend. One weekend, when he was off to visit my mother after spending the week teaching children at a school, the traffic seemed to be really slow. Eventually it came to a complete stop, which caused my dad great irritation. What's this? cried my dad as he peered ahead. The car crept along in fits and starts, a few metres at a time. This was before mobile phones, so my dad had nothing to do but curse and peer and wait for the traffic to move. Ten minutes went by, and then twenty, until finally my dad was able to drive ever so slowly around the bend where he saw a policeman. Hello, officer, said my dad, who always tried to be polite to policemen even when he was angry. Do you know why this traffic is going so slowly? I surely do, replied the police officer. There's been an accident up in front, and you'll have to drive round it. Dad bent his neck and peered some more out of his window. The officer was right. A huge boulder had fallen down the cliffs and was blocking the lane he was driving in. It was the biggest boulder Dad had ever seen. It seemed bigger than a car. By crikey, Dad said, that's a bloody big rock. The cars moved ever so slowly around the boulder one by one as another policeman waved them past. Dad stopped and started his car, and eventually it was his turn to drive around it. This is where the story gets horrible, 
because as Dad crept around the boulder which was bigger than his car as he'd suspected, he peered a bit closer and saw the strangest thing. There was a little layer of blue protruding out from under the boulder. It seemed to be an inch thick and just stuck out from the edges. What on earth's that? Dad thought to himself. It was only when he inched past the front of the boulder and saw what seemed to be the tip of a squashed headlight that he realised what had happened. There was a car under that boulder, a car that had been driving just in front of Dad, with people in it. One moment they were driving along, either laughing away or worrying about their problems, or doing nothing at all, when a big fat boulder fell from the hill above and squashed them and their car on the road, to the size of a pancake, all in one second or less. It was horrible. They would not even have known it had happened. They went from human to pancake in less time than it took you to read this sentence. Oh dear, thought Dad as he drove quickly away, and he's been telling this story ever since. I told Dad once that I liked science, and I wanted to study it when I was at high school. Ah, science, he said. I knew a science teacher once. I knew straight away that he was going to tell one of his stories, and that it would be horrible. Really, Dad? I said. What was he like? Ah, he was a fine old fellow, Dad reminisced. It was his science experiment that went awry. Dad used to be a teacher, you see, and he had a lot of stories about teaching. In one of his stories, a teacher who wasn't a very nice fellow at all was out mowing his lawn on his property, right out in the suburbs. He was using one of those ride-on mowers with big sharp blades that swirled and swirled and chopped up everything under it. I actually guess where this story was going, even though I was only ten. This not very nice man was riding up and down the little hills on his property over the grass and under the trees. He rode over snakes and even tried to ride over a bird. He chuckled through his big bushy beard as he did so. At least, my dad said he did. Of course, in time, the horrible happened as it had to, and this man took his eyes off the ground as he was chasing a wombat. He hit a rock, and his lawnmower flipped over and pinned him down. Of course, the big sharp blades under his mower started lawn mowing his legs, which was very distressing for the not very nice man, as he was quite fond of his legs. It was before all the modern safety gadgets, Dad explained solemnly, and also before mobile phones, so the big bearded man, who wasn't very nice, but didn't deserve to have his legs mowed, had to lie there, calling out for help, hoping he wouldn't die. Luckily for him, his wife came to visit, and was able to stop the mower and take him to hospital, where they were able to save his life, but not his legs. And so the particularly horrible bit is that this teacher couldn't ever walk again, after his legs were mowed to shreds because he tried to run over a wombat. Instead, his wife bought him a wheelchair, and he had to wheel himself around the school and use a special ramp built just for him. The funny thing, according to my dad, was that having his legs mowed actually made this not very nice bearded man into a nice man, after all, who knew what was important in life. Dad thought that was quite funny indeed. But back to Dad's science teacher. Unlike the mower man, this fellow was well liked by Dad and the other teachers and the students as well, because he used to do experiments that popped and whizzed and made colourful sparks. All of the children in other classes were jealous. On this particular occasion, the teacher had gone to great effort to set up a beaker on his desk at the front of the classroom, along with jars of brightly coloured chemicals. Gather round, children, said the teacher. This is a marvellous experiment that you will tell your friends and family about forever. And gather round they did. There were big children, and small children, and ugly children, and smiley children. Some of the children laughed at the thought of an experiment with sparks and thrills, whereas others were not very interested at all and wished they could sleep under their desks. Jimmy was certainly interested. He was short and squat, and he hurried up to the front so that he could peer over the table at the beaker. Then there was Rex, who was very tall and had gangly arms. He stood next to Jimmy and bent his head so that he wouldn't miss a thing. 
The teacher poured one green solution into the beaker, and then a red one. A blue flame burned under the beaker, causing the mixed solution to bubble slightly and slowly at first, and then quicker and quicker with larger and larger bubbles. What's going to happen, sir? A little boy asked, somewhat frightened. Ah, said the teacher, you see, the red chemical represents... And then the horrible thing happened, just as I knew it would. After all, Dad didn't have any happy stories. The beaker exploded. It exploded with such force that the headmaster, who was three buildings away, heard it, and it knocked over his tea. It exploded with such force that Rex, who was tall and gangly, had razor-sharp slithers of glass blow right across his stomach, which tore a nasty hole in his middle section, and meant he had to go to hospital so doctors could save his life. And for little Jimmy, who was peering with all his might over the table to see what would happen, it exploded with such force that the top of his little head got blown right off, and he died, along with the teacher. It was horrible. That story from my dad is why I don't want to study science when I go to high school. I like playing outdoors. Most boys do. I take my bike and ride all over the place hunting for turtles and lizards and mischief, which is fine by my mum, so long as I'm home by six. The one thing mum doesn't like, though, is when I hurt myself like I did the time I got grit in my eye when I was making mud bombs to use in a trap for my sister. Mum didn't like that. Your eyes are precious, David, she would say as she dabbed out the mud with a tea towel. Dad, of course, did not tell me that my eyes were precious. Instead, he told me stories about eyes of people he knew. Horrible stories. Like the story of when he went on school camp back when he was a teacher. He went over to Morton Island with a group of children for a school outing. They caught the barge and saw a hammerhead shark and camped on the beach. They had a wonderful time and even got to eat stale chips for free at the one store in the middle of the island. It was only when they went hiking into the rainforest that things got horrible. There were leeches everywhere and although one little boy didn't know it, he got a little leech on his face. Not a big deal really, a little leech. They're so tiny you can normally just flick them off with your finger. It was only a big deal because this leech wriggled its way round the side of this little boy's face and into his eye socket as he merrily hiked his way across Morton Island with his classmates. He didn't even notice it was there, it was so little. The only problem with little leeches is that once they start sucking your blood, which is what leeches do, they get bigger. Normally that's how you find them, as bloated as a leech. Bloated with your blood which they've just sucked out of you with their fangs. You then have to get them off, sometimes with salt, sometimes with a little peel and a scream, in fact, always with a scream, because leeches are horrible. But that isn't the horrible part of this story. The horrible part is that the leech had actually managed to wriggle its way around to the back of this merry boy's eye. That's right, the back. And once it was there, the leech then proceeded to do what leeches do. It drank the boy's blood which made the leech fat, very fat. A fat leech cannot fit very well where a thin leech can. A fat leech cannot fit very well behind a merry boy's eye. In fact, the merry boy became more and more agitated the bigger the leech became, because the leech was by then on the back of the boy's eyeball, right next to his brain. It's not a place that things normally go, especially fat things. But if you think the boy was agitated as the leech got fatter, you should have heard him scream when a teacher told him he could see a leech at the back of his eye, but it was so fat that nobody could get to it. The leech was stuck behind this boy's eye and next to his brain. A fat leech. It was horrible. The screaming boy had to go to hospital for emergency leech eye surgery. He survived, but it was horrible. That isn't, of course, the most horrible eye story Dad told me. He always has another story. The most horrible eye story involved a boy who was out playing with his friend, and his friend happened to be my dad. Dad and this boy were out playing on the streets of Newcastle, which is where Dad grew up. It was the same park where Dad's sister Megsy found half a child's finger on a swing where it had been ripped off. According to Dad, she took it home to her mother in a matchstick box. Her mother was disgusted and threw it away. Horrible. 
So they were playing, Dad and his friends, in this finger park, having a good time running about and laughing, tackling each other and bumping into things like healthy children should. It was then that Dad's friend ran past a tree and got poked in the eye by a twig. No big deal. It was just a poke. Nobody likes being poked in the eye. But apart from it being a bit red, Dad's friend was able to keep playing for a while until he declared he wanted to go home, which he did. It was only later that night that he complained to his mother that his eye was a bit sticky and he was blinking all the time. His mother was concerned, as good mothers are, but told her son to sleep on it overnight and they would go to the doctors in the morning if it was still bothering him. And so Dad's friend went to sleep like his mother said and got up in the morning to see if his eye was still bothering him. As it turned out, he was bothered by it in the morning, quite a bit, because his eye had drained out onto the pillow during the night. All he had left was an empty eye sack where his lovely eye used to be. Absolutely horrible. Which is why, according to my dad, it is all fun and games until someone loses an eye. And it's also why, every morning when I wake up, I check to see if my eyes have drained out before I go off to school. You know how it is when you have your hand outside of your car window too far and your father tells you to pull it back in so you don't get hurt? Well, that might be your father. But my father just chuckled and told me a story when I did it. Yes, you can imagine by now what sort of story this might be. Whenever I'm doing something that causes my dad to tell me a story, any story, I stop doing it, right away. Because all his stories are horrible and I don't want to end up in one of them myself. But the boy in this story didn't have anyone to warn him. He was just a little fellow at Dad's school. They used to catch the bus together, which the boy quite liked as it was his own Dad's bus. So he felt quite important when he caught the bus, this boy. On this one day, the day of my Dad's story, my Dad and this boy were getting on the bus after school. As usual, the boy was quite proud to be on the bus and he was helping his dad guide the bus past a sign. How far, son? The boy's dad called out from the front of the bus. The boy stretched his head out of the bus, you could do that with bus windows in those days, and took a good look. You've got heaps of room, said the boy loudly so that the other children could hear. Beauty, thought the dad before putting his foot down the accelerator. Snap went the boy's neck as it caught the sign, which was closer than either the boy or the boy's dad realised. Horrible. Dad was one of the children who ran from the bus screaming when the boy lurched back dead into his seat, eyes bulging and neck bent at an impossible angle. And that's why I don't put my arm outside the car windows any more. My sister Jane nagged Dad for a bird for years. Can we, Dad? she would ask. Can we? Of course, in the end, we could, because Dad is a good dad. But being Dad, he didn't just go down to the shops to buy a little bird cage. Instead, he built a big cage, an aviary, out of wood and chicken wire. It was magnificent. Of course, we all had to have birds. My brother Robert, who helped Dad build the cage, wanted a turkey and didn't get it. Jane, who didn't help, wanted a peacock. She didn't get that either. In the end, we all got lovebirds. They're beautiful birds, lovebirds. They tweet and jump and fly and hop. You can ask them to sit on your finger and sometimes they do just for the fun of it. I had a yellow lovebird. I named him Eats. I don't know why I named him Eats, but he was mine and I loved him. We used to spend all our time together, Eats and I. At least when I wasn't spending time with my dog Jacko. Eats used to follow me around the cage when I was close and call for a little scratch on his head which I would give him. He even had some babies which he cared for and let me hold as they went from pink to bright blue or green or some other lovely colour as they got older. Eats raised a family a number of times until he started to look a little old himself, a little dishevelled, run down, past his prime. That didn't bother me though, he was still my friend and we enjoyed our playtime together every day after school. Except one day when I came home, Eats wasn't there. Where's Eats? I cried to no one in particular. My dad heard me from the living room and came out the back and asked me to sit down. He had a new story, a story from just that day. I was devastated before he began, 
I'd heard Dad's stories before. This one involved Dad taking pity on Eats, who by this stage didn't have many feathers and seemed to be getting eaten alive by nits of some sort. He was just too old, David, he said. It was for the best. I cried and I cried as I thought of Eats trustingly jumping on Dad's hand one last time. Dad had wrung Eats' neck to put him out of his misery, which is a constant theme in Dad's thinking, although in his mind it usually involves a brick. It was bad, but it's not horrible as such, I thought. Even in my grief I could see it was best for Eats, as nobody wants to have no feathers and be eaten alive by nits. What I didn't know, and what came out a couple of years later, was that this wasn't the whole story. With a strange half-grin on his face that accompanies all of his tales, Dad told me what really happened. I had tears in my eyes when I wrung Eats' neck that day, David. It wasn't easy, let me tell you. No, I wouldn't expect it to have been Dad, I said. He was my little mate, and I was very sad. No, I didn't mean that, said Dad. The little fellow wouldn't die, so I had to use all my strength to wring his neck. The horrible bit is that his head came off in my hands. You know a story is horrible when my dad admits it is. I can't describe the sheer gut-wrenching sickness I felt at the thought of my dad ripping my pet's head off with his bare hands to put him out of his misery. That's why I've since declined any of dad's suggestions that anyone or anything be put out of its misery, especially with his help. One consequence of listening to Dad's stories all my life is that I do not see things the same way as another child does. I tend to see the funny side first. On the day of this story I was in my little house on my little street where my family and I spend most of our time. Dad was cleaning, which he does every now and then, to put everything in order and to turn the lights off. He hates us wasting electricity. So Dad was going from room to room humming and cleaning and turning lights off, when he came to a desk in my mum's study. On the desk was one of those big bill spikes that people can spike paper bills onto one by one, where they stay until the bills are paid. Now Dad didn't think anything of this bill spike, because at that stage he didn't know he was in his own story. If he had known, he might have been more cautious. But he didn't. And so, spotting a dollar coin on the floor next to the desk, Dad bent over with all his might to pick it up. All of his might. With all of his might, which is considerable, Dad bent right down towards the desk. Unfortunately for Dad, he didn't quite calculate the distance between his balding head and the bill spike, perhaps because Mum had cut his eye with the corner of a map on their trip to New Zealand when she was trying to navigate. Whatever the reason, his head hit that bill spike with lots and lots of force. So much force that if the bill spike had hit his eye, it would have gone into his brain, and to use his words, put him out of his misery. It didn't, though. It hit him right in the forehead, just under his bald patch. This was quite a shock to my poor old dad, who was not used to being in his own stories in this way after all. Ah! he cried in horror. Because it's quite horrible having a bill spike stuck in your head. Ah! he cried again as he stood up with a bill spike lodged in the bone of his skull. Ah! he cried as he ran through the room in ever greater distress, as all he could see was a telephone company bill hanging off the spike right in front of his eyes. Ah! he cried one last time as he ran past the rest of us and down the hallway, not knowing really what was happening to him after all, at least until the bill spike fell out of his head. Yes, it was horrible. But to me, as a little boy who'd heard enough stories like that to think them normal, it was horrible, but funny too, especially when he ended up fine, except for a little scar and a bill spike sized dent in his skull. Perhaps I've finally turned into my dad, because now it's my story, and I've started telling it to everyone who'll listen, with a little smile on my face, including to you.